So what is the nature of the Chinese Green Revolution narrative? And I think um, while we could go back further in history, and there have been recurrent famines, um, the most recent and most dramatic one was China's Great Famine of 1958 to 1961, which reportedly killed 36 million people, which is just astounding. Okay? Um, and this was a, a, a seminal moment for the PRC. There are debates about whether this famine was human caused or natural caused, um, but you know, even irrespective of those debates, okay, from that period moving forward, food self-sufficiency becomes a major priority for the government of the People's Republic. Um, and China responded in a couple of different ways. Okay, first of all, it's determined to become food self-sufficient, and initially. It's, it's, it has a dual approach. Okay? One is a green revolution approach patterned after what is happening or what is being spearheaded by Western countries in the 60s and 70s. But also init initially it has an agroecological approach, this kind of biointensive approach. So there's, there's this piece, how do we increase uh, agricultural production? But then secondly, um, and this doesn't um, become aggressively enforced or, or put into place until the uh, late 1970s, that's the one-child policy. So to uh, rein in population growth, okay? Um, I think China's opening up to the world, um, and you know, this is often um, uh, most clear in our minds with Nixon's visit in, in, to China in 1972, that opening up influenced the path that China eventually took in terms of agriculture. Um, and one of the first types of exchanges that occurs after that, that Nixon visit is the exchange of Green Revolution technology with the West. Um, and in particular, uh, China ordered 13 of the largest, most modern American designed nitrogen fertilizer plants. Okay? And more were subsequently purchased. And so then China becomes the world's largest producer of nitrogenous fertilizers, which are being used in combination with uh, hybrid seeds to boost uh, yields and production. And this, this biointensive path, which had, uh, was being explored up until that point, is more or less left to the wayside. Okay? So this, this is a, a critical moment. The next um, critical moment is um, a series of changes which occur after Mao Zedong's death. Um, so you have a reformist faction of the Communist Party uh, which comes into power in 1979 um, and they begin to implement a series of changes in the agricultural sector. So agriculture is decollectivized, it's decentralized, and you have the introduction of what they call the household responsibility system. So you still have a quota that you need to fill and provide to the state, but then if you exceed that quota, your, your, the production is, is that of the households. They can do with it what they want. They can consume it, they can sell it. Okay? And people are also granted individual tenure rights. It's not private tenure like we're used to in the West, but it's usufruct rights. Households have secure use rights to that land. So instead of collectivized production, it's individual household production. Um, and also there's a policy of, um, you know, increasing uh, kind of free market approach to pricing so that producer prices rise for, for what people are producing, okay? So um, this um, set of reforms, okay, in combination with the use of new green revolution technology is argued is what led to an astronomical rise in agricultural production in the Chinese continent. So by 1984, food rationing is lifted. Okay? Uh, China has a per capita uh, food supply by the 80s that is close to what Japan has, so a very kind of comfortable uh, mean situation. And this is just uh, some uh, 
information. This is uh, provided by USDA. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm not going to point too much here, but you see through the 70s, 80s, and 90s uh, increasing production um, both of grains and of oil seeds, okay? which again are linked back to uh, this, this series of reforms. Okay? So this particular approach okay, um, and this success in the agricultural sector is argued by other scholars as well, um, Gulati and Fon, for example, um, that this success in the agricultural sector leads to subsequent success in terms of industrialization. Okay? So it's called the firing from the bottom strategy. So you have to develop your agricultural sector before you can um, uh, become successful at industrialization. Um, and uh, this, if I look at this particular table reminds me a lot of Rostow's modernization theory, his stages of economic growth, that you go from subsistence to commercial agriculture, and that surplus allows you to, to invest in industrialization. Um, but people are also arguing that developing agriculture is really key for reducing poverty. Um, and some work suggests that uh, the, the growth in agriculture um, contributed to poverty reduction four times as much as the subsequent uh, increase in manufacturing did. So because of this success, okay, um, the Chinese example is often um, used uh, to promote the Green Revolution approach. And this is not new, okay? So uh, Norman Borlaug, uh, the, the grandfather of the Green Revolution, has um, uh, for many years prior to his death was using China as this great success story. So this is not something new. So he writes, you know, since 1980, Ch 1980 China has been the greatest success story. Home to one-fifth of the world's people, China today is the world's biggest food producer. With each successive year, its cereal crop yields approach that of the United States. So that's 